Hello, I'm Ken Woodall, Assistant Director of the Training Division for the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. I will be your host for this presentation. Together, we will review the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, commonly known as HSEEP. This presentation is strictly an overview of HSEEP. It is strongly recommended that individuals attend the 24-hour HSEEP training course. HSEEP is a capabilities and performance based program that provides tools, resources, common terminology, and methodologies to assist in building a self sustaining exercise program. Exercises are conducted for many reasons. The conduct and outcomes of exercises assist us in the development of plans, policies, and procedures, and ultimately provides a process to improve our capabilities in responding to and recovering from natural or man-made disasters. HSEEP can be illustrated within this picture. It is a cycle that is divided into program and project management principles. Within these two divisions are key components that make up the HSEEP program. Each component builds upon the other until the cycle repeats itself or become self-sustaining. An important concept of HSEEP is the building block approach. Exercises should build upon one another, increasing in difficulty and complexity. HSEEP contains two categories of exercises, discussion-based and operations-based. Within these two categories, reside seven types of exercises that can be conducted. Discussion-based exercises do not involve deployment of resources or assets and generally involve the validation of plans, policies, and procedures. The types of exercises within the discussion-based category include seminars, workshops, tabletops, and games. Seminars are designed to bring people up to speed on newly developed or revised plans, policies, or procedures. It is led by a presenter or facilitator and is conducted in a lecture setting. Workshops are exercises that produce a product or an outcome. Typically, a workshop brings individuals together to revise plans, policies, or procedures or to develop new documentation. A workshop involves more participant discussion than the lecture setting of a seminar. Tabletop exercises are the most common discussion-based exercise type. You may have already been involved in a tabletop exercise. The tabletop, or TTX, is designed to validate plans, policies, and procedures. Participants should bring plans, policies, and procedures to a tabletop exercise when serving as a participant. This avoids guessing or shooting from the hip when discussing operational type issues. Games are probably the least commonly used exercise type. A game is typically an opposing force or one-on-one -on -one type of activity. Often, games are developed with the use of computer or simulation software. Our military partners have practical applications or uses for the game style exercise activity. Operations based exercises are more intensive. As difficulty increases in the exercise type, the need for more resources to execute the exercise will increase as well. Operations based exercise types include drills, functional exercises, and full-scale exercises. Exercise drills are designed to validate or test a new procedure, a new tactic, or the use of new equipment. It is a single agency or single function that is being exercised. Examples of drills might include a triage drill 
in a mass casualty incident, the use of ladders in a ladder drill for fire departments, or practicing a felony stop procedure for law enforcement. The drill is a very focused exercise. A functional exercise falls just short of deploying assets or resources into the field setting. Typically, the functional exercise will test command post, emergency operations centers, and the plans, policies, and procedures used by these entities. A functional exercise is conducted in real time and can be highly stressful. The full-scale exercise is the pinnacle of all exercise types. It is the culmination of all other smaller exercises, revised plans, enhanced training and equipment acquisition into one exercise event. The full-scale exercise is the most resource intensive and costly exercise activity to execute and proper planning should be employed when a full-scale exercise has been scheduled. The recommended minimum time frame for planning and conducting a full-scale exercise should be one year. Developing discussion or operations-based exercises fall within the project management portion of the HSEEP cycle. This is the design and development phase. Project management involves many functions. Some are critical to the success of an exercise. Setting out a solid plan for your exercise project is essential. This must include good project budgeting. If grant funds are being used to support your exercise project, it is important to know what types of expenditures are allowable and more importantly, not allowable. Staying on schedule is critical to overall exercise success. The planning for your exercise should include a timeline of events. These events include planning conferences, due dates for assignments, and any other essential task that will be needed to conduct your exercise. The timeline helps keep things on track. The exercise planning team is responsible for the management of the exercise from the beginning to the end. Members conduct or perform assignments, develop documentation, facilitate planning meetings, and ensure that all planning activities are fulfilled. The lead planner is responsible for the group. Planning team size should be proportional to the exercise type and scope. It may not seem obvious as many tasks associated with design and development are dependent upon one another during the planning process, but it should be pointed out that there are differences. It might be easier to understand in these terms. The design is the ideas of an exercise, and the development is turning the ideas into reality. Every exercise must have a purpose. Why are we conducting an exercise? How is it important to our agency or the safety of the public? The purpose defines the goal or goals that you hope to meet during the conduct of the exercise. It is important to note that your exercise is not a failure if it does not ultimately meet the goals that were set. It is only a failure if you do not learn or determine the root cause for the shortfall and improve upon those shortfalls. The scope of the exercise is dependent on the type, location, number of agencies and participants, and other factors. The scope of your exercise will grow depending upon the complexities that are injected into the planning phase. The scope of an exercise can get out of control if the planning team is not disciplined in decision making and maintaining focus. Exercise practitioners who have experienced an uncontrolled expansion of the exercise plan call it scope creep. Scope creep can lead to an uncontrollable exercise. The development of exercise objectives is critical to exercise planning. 
Objectives define what will be tested, under what conditions, by who, and to what standard. Objectives are the framework for the exercise itself. Many think that the exercise scenario should be developed first, but this is not the case. It's no different than sitting in a training class. The first things the instructor goes over are the course objectives. Exercises are no different in that respect. After objectives are defined, scenario development can begin. The scenario sets the stage for the exercise. The scenario is built to drive participants towards the objectives. The scenario can be as brief as a paragraph or even a sentence. Do not confuse the scenario with the cascading events that expand from the scenario or main event. Those cascading events are contained within the Master Sequence of Events list, or MESL. All exercises require the generation of certain documents. The type of exercises will dictate the type of documentation that will be needed for a particular exercise. Discussion-based exercises typically require less documentation than operations-based exercises. Be sure you budget for the printing of these materials. The conduct and evaluation phase of project management includes the execution of the exercise, the evaluation of that exercise, and the after-action reporting. The majority of discussion-based action comes from the moderated participant discussions, either as a whole, group, or in breakout sessions. Moderators and facilitators are essential to keeping the discussions on track to meet exercise objectives. Operations-based exercises are personnel intensive and can incur a high dollar cost. Pre-planning is extremely important and planning timelines should be long range. A full-scale exercise of average scope and complexity should be planned at least a year in advance. Evaluation is the yardstick by which an organization measures capabilities. Good evaluations result in suggestions for filling or bridging capability gaps and making needed improvements. Evaluations also capture best practices and high performance. Exercise evaluation guides may contain three levels of evaluation. Task level analysis involves assessing specific, discrete actions that individuals or groups must successfully perform or address during an exercise. Activity level analysis involves assessing groups of similar tasks that, when carried out according to plans and procedures, allow an entity to demonstrate an associated capability. Capability level analysis involves assessing an entity's ability to demonstrate its priority capabilities necessary to successfully prevent, protect against, respond to, or recover from the threat or hazard simulated in the exercise scenario. The After Action Report, or AAR, is the document that is produced after the conduct of an exercise. It is this document that formulates the improvement needs that are carried over to the improvement plan. Past After Action Reports should be reviewed when planning a future exercise. These documents can assist in laying the foundation for other exercises based on the review items within the AAR. The After Action Conference is the formal setting in which the draft After Action Report is reviewed. All exercise participants are encouraged to participate in the After Action Conference. Comments, corrections, and additions can be made to the draft report and the improvement plan improvement matrix can be incorporated into the report. The final AAR is then completed and disseminated based on agency policy. 
The improvement planning process is the process by which we determine the root cause of problems identified during the evaluation process of the exercise. During the conduct of the after action conference, we incorporate the IP process. We gain consensus from the participants on recommendations and incorporate those recommendations into the improvement plan. Once recommendations and action items have been identified, organizations should ensure that each item is tracked to completion and improvements are implemented based off the improvement plan. For ease of review, a matrix can be developed and incorporated into the final after action report. It can be a simple spreadsheet indicating what was at issue, the recommendation to improve the issue, what action will be taken, and who is assigned the responsibility for completing the improvement. A completion date is also assigned to that item. The lead planner, agency head, or program manager may be charged with following up on the improvement items to chart the progress. The HSEEP cycle, as I said, is broken into two categories, project management and program management. We have discussed the project management phases, and now we will focus on the program management phases. As you can see from the chart, program management contains four key areas. Developing and maintaining a self-sustaining program is essential to effective program management. Multi-year planning provides the backbone to a self-sustaining program. With a defined multi-year plan, a program manager can budget accordingly, develop funding proposals based on the multi-year plan, and track the improvements over a period of time. The multi-year plan should focus on agency priorities that align with state and federal priorities. This becomes extremely important if funding is dependent on federal grant programs. Alignment to state and federal priorities increases the possibility of grant funding to your program. Don't forget to incorporate past exercise activities and after action reports. The improvement planning workshop may be conducted to incorporate past after action reports into future plans and exercises. The focus is strictly on those items that have been identified in past AARs related to exercises and real world events. Having this information consolidated and prioritized provides for a seamless transition and incorporation into the TEPW, Training and Exercise Planning Workshop. The multi-year training and exercise plan is the roadmap for training and exercise activities. This three or five year plan provides focus for the training and exercise programs and is essential in maintaining a self-sustaining program. Within the multi-year plan resides the multi-year schedule. The schedule projects out over a three to five year period of planned events. Training and exercise activities can be placed on this schedule as well as key events within your jurisdiction that may take place on a yearly basis. The schedule helps prevent overlap of other events, provides stakeholders with an opportunity to consolidate activities or like capabilities, and aids in preventing training and exercise burnout. The Training and Exercise Planning Workshop, or TEPW, is the environment where the multi-year plan and schedule are developed. Key stakeholders are encouraged to attend and provide input into this process. The TEPW is key in coordinating and deconflicting training and exercise activities. The HSEEP cycle is a standardized approach to training and exercise project and program management. The methodology is designed to assist in building a self-sustaining program. In reality, some of the principles within HSEEP could be applied to other programs. Indiana encourages the use of HSEEP and mandates its use when federal grant funds are being used in part or in whole for training and exercise activities. The Indiana Department of Homeland Security has developed a comprehensive training and exercise guidance 
that provides important information applicable to HSEEP compliance. To learn more about HSEEP, please contact the Indiana Department of Homeland Security or visit the U.S. DHS HSEEP website. Thank you for your time.